Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the fifth lecture in Microsoft Research's series on race and technology. My name is Nancy Baim. I'm a researcher in Microsoft Research, and I'm your host for this amazing lineup of speakers from multiple disciplines presenting their groundbreaking scholarship at the intersection of race and technology. We hope that the series demonstrates the range of ways that race and tech construct one another, and we hope that with such awareness, we might build a more just and equitable future. Some of you are already experts, especially if you've been here for the last four talks, and we hope that for you, the breadth of topics we're covering will expose you to some new ideas and spark some new connections. Others may be tuning into these ideas for the first time. Some of you are gonna be excited to find language for things you kind of knew, but didn't have words for. Others might find yourself kind of upset, upset or unsettled. The social construct of race is an uncomfortable topic, one that's hard to discuss, and I want to acknowledge that potential discomfort. So whether you're new to the topic or familiar, comfortable or uneasy, I wanna thank you for being here today to be part of this essential discussion. I'll be monitoring questions in the Q&A and to pose after the talk, so feel free to put those in as we go along. Today, I'm super excited because I get to introduce Professor Lisa Nakamura, who was the first scholar whose work I read on this essential topic back in the mid 1990s when I was teaching about the internet and communication. Um, so 25 years plus of stellar scholarship that she's brought to this topic. Um, she's currently the Director of Digital Studies Institute and the Gwendolyn Calvert Baker Collegiate Professor of American Culture at the University of Michigan. She's the author of many, many books on race, gender, and the internet, most recently Race, Racist Zoom Bombing, co-authored with Hannah Stevenson and Kyle Lindsay, and Techno Precarious, with Rayvon Fouché, Stephanie Dinkins, Remy Yergo, Catherine Knight-Steele, and our upcoming speaker, Andre Brock, she recently received a $4.8 million grant from the Mellon Foundation to found the Disco Network for Digital Inequality, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism. Oh, excuse me, Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism. The goal is to create a scholarly resource network for writing, teaching, and making. And I'll mention that they're currently hiring a postdoc, so check the chat for uh, information on that. Uh, Lisa's talk today is called Women of Color and the Digital Labor of Repair. Please join me in welcoming her, and thanks for being here. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement that the University of Michigan, from the place I'm delivering this talk from, is located in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations made the single largest land donation to the University of Michigan offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Though through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. I'd also like to give a content warning for profanity and racism. I'm going to be showing some videos from TikTok and Instagram. Some of it's been bleeped out, but not all of it has. So as Nancy was saying, my expertise um, is in digital media theory, comparative ethnic studies, feminist theory, Asian American studies, and game studies. Um, I've been writing books on race and racial embodiment, um, the way that race is contested and constructed in digital environments since 1994. Um, I've written two books on this topic, Cybertypes and Digitizing Race, and most recently two co-authored books which have been updating this area for contemporary platforms like Zoom. Um, there's been an incredible uptick in racist and sexist Zoom bombing or attacking meetings for the purposes of disrupting people of color and women's identities, um, as well as um, a lot of precarity around digital labor. Um, and these are in books by Techno, Precar like Techno Precarious, which I wrote with the Precarity Lab and Racist Zoom Bombing. The talk I'm going to give you now is from my next book, which is about women of color's online activism as labor and their past, present, and speculative contributions to the internet as we wish it could be. Therefore, more optimistic than work I've done before. Um, this work is infrastructuralist. It's comparative. It historicizes what women are doing, posting anti-racist content online, reporting and performing free moderation for a lot of hate speech platforms um, that tolerate violations and really have a hard time moderating. 
Um, and otherwise, building, protecting, and repairing a public internet and gaming culture where women of color, women, LGBTQA people, young people, and other marginalized groups can not only exist, but can thrive. To start, though, women of color make our digital products, and they always have. They assemble them in Asian factories, and their chief labor has made the tech industry's innovation possible. This presentation focuses on their immaterial and knowledge work that contributes directly to the Internet's usability. Women of color on social media and gaming platforms contribute unpaid labor to document misogyny, racism, violations of user agreements through reporting, and other hateful behavior. They also lead our most effective and important campaigns against racism from their keyboards. One example, BLM, um, a, hash a hashtag based movement. This is piecework in the classical sense, squeezed in between paid work and leisure. It is not paid, but it is productive. It is unpaid not because it's not valuable, but because the type of person who is doing it, a type of person whose work is not considered valuable or compensable because it has not been in the past, is performing it. Therefore, this labor of digital repair and social repair is exactly the kind of labor that can't be automated or outsourced. Therefore, worth looking at. Racial harassment and toxicity are major problems for platform companies and, by extension, our political climate, our health information system, economic equity, and user safety and well-being. And we all know that automated forms of moderation or outsource moderation or mitigation are just not working. In 2019, I gave a TED Talk named after my freshman seminar, The Internet is a Trash Fire, because even though we have varying degrees of investment, um, entitlement, commitment about what to do about it, we all can agree it's a trash fire. And it's getting worse. According to a 2021 Pew study called the State of Internet Harassment, while 41% of people overall have experienced some form of online harassment, the same as in a study a few years earlier, quote, growing shares of Americans report experiencing more severe forms of harassment, which encompasses physical threats, stalking, sexual harassment, and sustained harassment. And 75% of these occurred on social media. This is more common among young people. For the first time, more than half of all users under 30 have been abused online, while well, young men report being abused more often than young women. Women in this age group are more likely to have been sexually harassed, stalked, and LGBTQA users in particular have a 7 in 10 chance of being abused most severely, um, far fewer than straight users. Similarly, as you might expect, race matters. More than half of black and Hispanic online targets measured in this report say they were attacked because of their race and ethnicity. Well, this was much less often the case for white targets. Young women of color are that place where this group meets, where these identities meet. They're also prolific content creators, and they're also the most likely to be harassed online. Therefore, the work of repair is the work of women of color who are also the most invested in repair and know the most about what to do about it. So this presentation is going to analyze two examples of their work as digital documentarians of public racism, looking at TikTok and Instagram using a comparative critical race studies and a visual studies approach. Um, we know from the history of women's, children's, and transgender people's labor as unpaid workers or volunteers at companies like America Online, where they worked as community leaders, unpaid community leaders, how they have modeled a high-touch, mutual aid-informed digital culture of care without ever getting paid for it. I want to also talk about some theoretical and speculative approaches to anti-racist platform alternatives, again, thinking into the future, and the ways that visual digital platforms for social life engender new racial and gendered solidarities and new kinds of intimacy. In other words, when we watch a video of somebody's life, we're drawn into their identities by um, virtue of seeing these. So um, Nancy, a groundbreaking researcher in the area of user culture, is just a wonderful human being and a real leader in our field. And I thank her for choosing to spend her time um, with this series engaging in deep critical conversation about digital inequality and the methods and tools that we're bringing to it. So I'm going to define some terms here. Um, one is anti-racism, which is a pretty recent term. Anti-racism is um, a term that was identified by the American Dialect Society, which meets every year, to talk about what words are most likely to succeed. 
Um, they define this as the practice of actively working to prevent or combat racism. And it's clustered with another word, BIPOC, um, indigenous, black, and people of color, um, as well as contactless, curbside, gigafire, and Zoomer. So there's so many resonances between these words. Um, they bring together technology, preventable and unpreventable disaster, long histories of racial disaffection, that is to say the separation of feeling from moments of personal and public disaster in order to preserve some space for the self. Sometimes it's very painful to feel everything that these words engender. As Kathy Park Hong explains, American, Asian American racism, like, racism against Asian Americans, has a particular resonance with, feeling, with feelings of squeamish and ambivalent minor feelings. As she says, she calls minor feelings the radicalized range of emotions that are negative, dysphoric, and therefore untelegenic, built from the sediments of everyday racial experience and the irritant of having one's perception of reality constantly questioned or dismissed. Minor feelings arise, for instance, upon hearing a slight, knowing it's racial, and being told, oh, that's all in your head. The videos I'm going to be showing you today make untelegenic feelings of everyday racism telegenic, spectacular, funny, interesting. Um, they push back against the space of negation and make the idea of anti-racism a more awkward rather than an, uh, sorry, more active rather than an awkward phrase. So anti-racism has been around for a while, but it has not take, caught on because it seems like something you don't do rather than something that you do do. It sounds like something you're failing or forgetting to do as opposed to an actual activity with a strategy and tactics. But its widespread adoption this year marks a recognition that combating racism isn't going to happen in a slow, passive, kind of sideways way. It has to be intentional, it has to be large scale, and it has to be systematic. So the women of color I'm going to look at here um, are part of this movement. Um, we can say that a research method is anti-racist if it critiques and moves beyond critique, if it does more than simply point out that something is problematic or the way that it operates. Instead, acknowledging the labor, the ingenuity, the cultural practice and the methodologies deployed by people of color in making and living with the digital objects that we deal with today and often feel very ambivalent about, you know, hating, loving them, not wanting to use them, feeling like we can't do without them, an example, especially um, today, I'm going to be talking about anti-racist work on social media that I call below the waterline. In other words, um, it's like earlier work on digital technology by women of color that history has seemingly forgotten, such as the labor of indigenous women on Navajo land. So I have here um, a little snippet from a statement from the United States Department of the Interior about Indians and how they were naturally suited to working um, with high-tech um, electronics. So I'll just read it for you in case you're not looking at this. One of the Bureau's concentrated efforts has been towards encouraging Indian tribes to link forces with the industrial and business community. As a result, manufacturers seeking workers with a combination of manual dexterity and highly developed sense of spatial relations are looking towards the Indian labor market. The Indian, with a natural affinity for precision work, is equally at home as a high-climbing steel structural worker and as a weaver of intricate designs. Somewhere between the two extremes lies electronic factory work, which calls for skill that is rooted in the pride of workmanship. So this work is already identified as inherent to the indigenous body. The mythology that Mohawks, uh, Indians, were not afraid of heights because of living in high places and therefore were ideal workers in these very dangerous occupations um, is very typical of the way that essentialist racism works. The idea that Asians are good at math or that African American people are, are good at sports. Um, so in the end, it's kind of part of the little known history of the early defense industry and the space industry that many of the components for those particular uh, military-based innovations were produced by Navajo women on a reservation run by the Fairchild Semiconductor Plant. So I have here some images from the Shiprock Dedication Commemorative Brochure um, published by the Shiprock, um, sorry, by the Fairchild Corporation to promote this new plant and to show how, in fact, weaving is inherent in the Navajo woman's body which would naturally produce 
something that looked like circuits. So while these women didn't participate in circuit design, those were all engineers, um, they were deeply in, involved in the creating of these objects. And what's more, they did it below minimum wage because Navajo land is not part of the US technically and they were not entitled to minimum wage. So this work is below the waterline in a couple senses. One, it was not acknowledged as work that was hard, but rather work that's inherent to Indians. It was not paid at a level that other US citizens would be paid at. And it was not acknowledged. I don't think most people think about Navajo women when they think about early computing. So their idea that circuit building could easily replace rug weaving, this kind of piecework could become factory work, is part of how women of color's work making material infrastructure has always lived below visibility. How that undefining of work, the extraction of standing, status, and value as tech workers, has led directly to why we do not define women of color's work witnessing and documenting racism today, moderating digital environments by reporting, by helping, by... Um, being part of this conversation around race and um, identity and doing community organizing, we don't define that as work either for similar reasons. Because as Tarleton Gillespie has shown us in his research on content moderation, oftentimes this labor exposes these women who are already very vulnerable to harassment um, from further punishment from platforms such as banning and suspensions. So unacknowledged and unsupported labor that is classified as not labor strengthens and shores up the idea that some bodies do work that is valuable because of who owns those bodies, what color those bodies are, what gender those bodies are, and that other labor is not labor, uh, is labor because it occupies different bodies. This is another way to understand why women's labor in the home isn't compensated in this country, why so children, senior citizens, and women who volunteered as community managers, onboarding and teaching new users weren't paid, but programmers are, why ch child um, content producers are not paid, why indigenous women made circuits for some of the most advanced technologies in the world. None of these were um, paid or paid minimum wage. So work below the waterline can be personally dangerous, emotionally exhausting, um, scaffolded upon rigid identity, identity ideas about what race does what, and perhaps most importantly, it is defined by not being acknowledged. So I use this term, the waterline, um, to acknowledge and bring together the theoretical work that black historians like Rayvon Fouché has done to raise up the suppressed contributions of black innovation in tech and sport. Black theorist Christina Sharp's work, which proposes the idea of the wake, as in uh, the, the path that a um, ship makes as it moves through the water, as a space of possibility for resistant praxis after slavery. And media industry scholar Vicki Mayer, whose work as an ethnographer in her book, Below the Line, Producers and Production Studies in the New Television Economy acknowledges the work of craft workers, television set factory workers, script girls, and other media labor deemed not creative, but nonetheless absolutely necessary for media products to get made, and in many cases far more creative than they're ever given credit for. Economic research estimating the value of women's unpaid domestic work brings visibility and legitimacy to what I'm calling the waterline and what's hidden under there in our everyday world. The British government offers a calculator to estimate the value of unpaid domestic work performed by women, $1.2 trillion US in 2019. Economist Nina Banks traces the history of black and other racialized women back to the early 20th century when black women founded the Atlanta Neighborhood Union in 1908 to repair the damage that systemic racism did by withholding resources from black communities. They provided for themselves what was not being provided for them. The women of color's work creating cooperatives and other associations to provide the services that governments didn't give them was indeed economic work. It increased value, it let life thrive, it, it filled in many missing pieces for what is necessary to live. It was not viewed as economic, it was viewed instead as political, and it was not paid. However, we are at a pivotal moment in redefining what work is, what's political and what's economic, and in reconsidering the effects of racism in our country, which we now, I think, understand is economic. This critique enables us to see what happens below the waterline and its place in contemporary labor politics when so much labor is platform labor, and when so many people are harmed, dissatisfied, and ready for change in the digital industries, I think we can say across both spectra of politics, everybody is tired. They're not happy with it. 
Also, COVID and working from home has engendered a really, I think, grassroots and long-lasting critique and resistance movement to work generally, work as usual. The Wall Street Journal in 2020 um, cited some data from the Labor Department, U.S. Labor Department, that said more workers are quitting their jobs than at any time in the last two decades. And a Microsoft report um, showed that 40% of workers are thinking of quitting their jobs. Therefore, labor is reconfiguring. It has done that, driven by technological change um, and politics. I would include in there racial and gender politics. So I'm going to show a viral video that demonstrates the social formation, um, the dissatisfaction with labor and its roots in anti-Asian labor history, and how this carries over into what we're talking about today. Whoa. Okay, say that again. Yeah, say that again. Oh, now you're shy? Say it again. Say it again. Now you're shy? What's wrong with you, man? Say it one more time. <laughs> yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, you need to leave. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. need to leave. That is not appropriate. You, you. You. <laughs> you need to leave. 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 Asian piece of you Oh my god. Right get okay. out of here. Yeah, I'm out. Get out. You are not allowed here. I already, I already put my. You do not talk to our guests like them. Get out now. Who are these? They are valued guests. Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah. Get out. Get out. You. You're a racist. You are not allowed here. This video was posted on Instagram and it got over a million views. Fourth of July in 2020. It depicts Michael Lofthouse, a, a Silicon Valley CEO who was sitting at a table by himself eating while um, Jordan Eli Chan, a young woman of color who made the video, was sitting with her family celebrating her aunt's birthday. This was at the um, Bernardus Lodge, which is a very high-end place uh, in California. The struggle over space you can see in this video, who needs to leave, has particular resonance given this moment. Outdoor patios were really precious commodities during the height of COVID, and given the history of anti-Asian and anti-immigrant racism in the U.S. Um, and the way that Asians in particular were blamed for COVID, um, this really struck a nerve, I believe. Um, Jenica Cochran, she's the waitress at the lodge, um, and Lofthouse shouting, you need to leave at each other, were asserting two different and related claims. The conditional hospitality of the host under the laws of private property at a restaurant, anybody can be asked to leave, um, and the conditional hospitality of the state, which Lofthouse is contending, right? He's saying, you need to leave to the family because as Asians, he does not see them as entitled to be in the country or in this restaurant. So that phrase, you need to leave, I think I've seen a lot of it in the last couple of years, um, exchanges the host's needs for the guest's needs. Um, the guest is the one at a loss. So Jenica Cochran is the host, but also as a server, um, she's supposed to supply the needs of the guest. Um, she did get Lofthouse to leave, but not before he tried to invoke his own privileges and rights as a client who had, quote, already put my effing order down here. So his attack upon the Chan family, I think, can be understood not only as part of the rising tide of anti-Asian racism in public, encouraged by our ex-president, um, who used words like Kung Flu to describe the disease, um, but as part of a long history of understanding Asian immigrants as never really citizens, stemming from the country's early exclusion of Asians as ineligible for citizenship, as well as this effort to disrupt people of color's joy, solidarity, and pleasure in public. So think Barbecue Becky, right? Um, the anti-Asian hate engendered by um, these claims that COVID was made in China, and therefore all Asians are responsible for that, um, motivated his disputing her claim they were value guests. You probably couldn't hear it that well, but he was saying they're value guests in a pandemic. He tried to approach the family he was, as he was being let out, but two you, customers you can't see actually helped her block him and got him out of there. When it was discovered that he was in fact a tech CEO Living in San Francisco, a city with a heavily Asian presence, I think some people wondered, how can he be so racist against Asian people? If there's one place where a minority group is well represented, not only in his industry, but in his place where he lives, it would be San Francisco. 
Yet on the other hand, anti-Asian racism in this country has always been strong, especially in the places where there are many Asian people. And it's been rooted in a visceral hatred of Asians as unfair laborers, as competition, and as degraded and polluted people. So I just want to point to this for a little bit. Um, in her comment, Chan really wanted to stress that Donald Trump was the one that she had to that she blamed for this. That this idea that foreigners and immigrants and people of color were open, kind of open, there's open, you know, what am I trying to say? It, it's possible to do whatever you want to them um, because our the president licensed it. He says white supremacy is a notorious habit. And then she asked people to vote because this the election wasn't happening yet. So here's a snippet of a, some coverage about this. Um, Lofthouse went viral. This whole thing went viral. And he was uh, forced to resign from his job. Um, so I'm going to come back to that again. So to go back to 1871, which was the year after the um, Naturalization Act that excluded Asians from becoming citizens, this image from an 1871 issue of Harper's Magazine entitled The Chinese Question depicts a young woman, quote, Columbia with a hand on a Chinese man's head facing an angry armed group saying, hands off, gentlemen, American means fair play for all men. In the background, you can see the flyers, very typical of what was going on at that time in California, reading, trades unions meetings resolved to oppose the, quote, importation of Chinese barbarians into the country must be stopped by ballot or bullet, quote, servile laborers, the degraded labor of Asia, the lowest and vilest of the human race opposed to him on the grounds of one race, two industry, three politics, for morality. This image was published, as I said, a year after the Naturalization Act, which explicitly excludes Chinese from citizenship, while extending naturalized citizenship to African Americans formerly held as slaves. In 1910, the U.S. Supreme Court extended the 1870 Naturalization Act to all other Asians, making them ineligible for citizenship. In 1941, 110,000 people of Japanese descent, most of whom were citizens, including my parents, were interned in concentration camps. And the following year, California fired all Japanese Americans employed by the state government. Chan's video and what happened to her after it went viral exemplifies the dangers of the anti-racist repair labor for young women of color. So let's compare two stories. Jenica Cochran, the brave waitress in the story, received over $100,000 from three GoFundMes, none of which were started by her. After her Instagram post went viral, Jordan Chan received so many hate messages and death threats that she had to make her account private, and it has since disappeared. In an extended interview with BuzzFeed, Chan thanks Cochran while critiquing the ways that she has been understood as the hero in the situation or as a white savior, while well, saying, and, and by no means that, that was her intention, but that given this history, um, that's what happened. And if we look at the buzz, the, sorry, the GoFundMe images, there's so much visual resemblance between Columbia and between Jenica Cochran in this picture. Um, as Chan says, if looking the other way in the face of public racism were not what we normally do, this would not be seen as heroic. It would just be an everyday act. So the act of verbally defending the family, her sincere outrage, and I think the really cathartic performance of anti-racist activism, this is what it looks like this is what it should be, satisfied many users' desires to see justice done. And it also repeated the visual trope of a white American woman in a flowing gown, an outraged goddess, the Columbia figure defending an abject and impotent Asian alien unable to defend themselves. Chan's act of posting this viral video was itself a form of defense that really fought with this trope of the silent and degraded Asian victim who needs defending. Lofthouse is stepping down as CEO fit into two narratives with a lot of traction. In 2020, there were two sides of the same coin. Um, cancel or call out culture and an invigorated anti-racist social movement. And you still hear people on the right blaming cancel culture. They would probably understand this that way because um, Lofthouse did in fact, sorry, lose his job as a result of this. Um, and after the mainstream media reported this is a case of clear-cut aggression against an Asian family, of course, there was a backlash. Um, the Chan family sued Lofthouse 
Um, he countersued them for reckless actions that ruined his personal and professional life and for rec recording him without his permission. Um, so PR Log and other outlets said that Lofthouse was a victim of both BLM and of cancel culture. The Chans, therefore, Chan's act was seen as too powerful as a form of labor that oversteps and is itself alien um, to what labor is and even what the law is. Um, PR Log describes um, Lofthouse as another victim of cancel culture fighting back, saying he was goaded into an argument and that Chan's video defamed him as a white supremacist, a racist, and other unsupported statements. Well, I think it's pretty clear what was happening in that video. Um, but they depict this as um, an act of black activism. Uh, they say that this act of documenting, distributing, and public critique was connected to a BLM protest that very day in Monterey, and that Chan and her family were known supporters of BLM. So this labor of digital repair is exactly the kind that we can't automate or outsource. It is overwhelmingly um, outsourced right now, with a lot of it going towards machine learning and people in other countries trying to do moderation without any of this cultural context. Um, in what the media gets wrong about Asian anti-Asian hate, sociologist Janelle Wong wants to really critique this inaccurate idea um, that Asian Americans face a unique level of hostility relative to other groups. Um, as she says, you know, the way viral video works is around spectacle. A lot of the ones we've seen that have gone viral have been attacks by black men on, on Asians, but this is the minority. Um, the majority of offenders are white, 75%, and most of the attacks are not physical. They're verbal abuse or shunning like what we just saw, and it's more often youth than elders. Um, also, um, Rachel Bowie, sorry, Rachel Koo and Matthew Bowie in their article against carceral data collection in response to anti-Asian violence really caution us to, um, to resist the narrative that Asians are being attacked in greater numbers and that we need to police better. Um, they focus instead on the slow violence of institutional racism. So what I'm showing here is a way to police without policing in a way, or rather not to police. <laughs> But to use the telegenic violence that social media really capitalizes on um, against itself, right? That most of it exploits Asian elders' pain, right? We watch people bleeding in the street, targets black people as a group, but it leaves out the more capillary kinds of violence that I'm showing here that, in, that young women make and circulate on Instagram and TikTok. So what I'm talking about is spectacle turned towards good, um, turned in a way to combat capillary white supremacy, right, in these kind of smaller ways, um, ways that allow conversation about racism, sovereignty, who gets to belong in what space by making them viral. And I'm, I think this is a kind of anti-carceral data collection. So I'm going to show you a TikTok, which is a really interesting contrast to this one. It was made by a woman made um, Sarah Pashadi, and it documents what happened to them in a park in Vancouver. So she called it and counted a wild Karen today. Taxes, I pay for this park, you and I don't like park. to see people wrecking it. We're not, we're not wrecking, wrecking it. it. There's oh literally so many berries everywhere. Oh my God, we're not wrecking it. Oh, there's so many berries out here. There's so many berries. <laughs> I cannot. So complete twits. <laughs> we're twits. You're the one coming up to two young girls, getting young mad girls. at them for yeah, picking you're like six year old. Six years old? Because we wanted to eat some berries. I'm saying, eat all the berries you want, just don't take the bush with you. I'm it's sorry, not the bush, it's literally a, it's a tiny personally. branch of berries. Why don't you mind your own business? Why this don't you mind your own any... business? You know, that is the fucking rudest thing you've said to me. You decided go to come up to Go back where you us. came from if you want to use language oh, like that. Oh, why don't you go back to where you came from, you fucking colonizer? <laughs> Are you First Nations? No, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Then don't call me a colonizer. You're a colonizer. You're, you're a Where did you come from? Yeah, where did you come from? Where did you come from? I'm actually curious. Where did US. You come from? US? Oh, yeah. So oh, you're not, so even you're from not here. Canadian either. Yeah, I am. Mm. Oh, so, but we are Canadian too. I was born here. I was born here too. Okay. Were you born here? No. I think that Canadian mm, really captures it for me. Um, this video shows how citizenship, sovereignty, and the conditional rights to space, especially public space, accorded young women of color, provide an op opportunity for dispute and conversation on TikTok, which has been a platform known as the issue space in contrast to the kind of commodified image space. These young women were told to go back to where you're, you came from if you're going to talk like that. But it's really the attacker's squiggly dance at the beginning and her inability to let it go. 
her desire to interrupt the relaxation and enjoyment of berries and fresh air for women of color that results in this post impact. Um, the TikTok clip at the end is a kind of mic drop, the way it just drops off after she says no. Um, and it's the result of these women's social media competencies that understand that style and aesthetic choice are part of how to turn the go back to your country trope on its head. Gabriella Rosner wrote a book called Critical Fabulations, Reworking the Methods and Margins of Design, um, which is an excellent piece of scholarship about how only certain types of people, creative, self-sufficient mo individuals modeled by the design process are recognized as designers who produce value. Nonetheless, all kinds of people who are seen as non-designers are absolutely indispensable to creative work. Their work is degraded, just like it was in 1870, 1871. Um, this work I'm talking about here is a relational act of care that keeps platforms usable by flagging hate speech and behavior, by capturing it in public and digital tools and sharing it with the world. Um, they fill in a gap where platform moderation strategies fail. So I want to point out, right, that racial aggression against Asians is, is very contextual. So go back to where you came from would probably not be flagged as a slur, and I don't think you could report it to Twitter. They wouldn't accept that. Um, nor would calling somebody an effing Asian. That wouldn't trip any, that wouldn't trigger anything or saying Trump is going to F you. These aren't really things that can be automated. So how can we bring our analytical skills and methods to bear on envisioning a different internet while well, at the same time acknowledging the work that young women of color do under the waterline where they deploy courage, wit, art, skill, and platform competency to document anti-Asian racism? How can our tools convert a simplistic reading that identifies with the perpetrator's frame of violence as a possible canceled victim who has been exposed and contextualizes instead as not being even about that person, but instead as a kind of capillary white supremacy that needs to be brought into the light and has been made viral by artful young women of color. So what these videos show is that this is more than content creation. It's the labor of social repair as optimistic, performative, intimate, funny, and relational. These are examples of um, users' um, maintaining and making better some of the platforms that we have in pushing back against the things that make platforms so hard to use. I would call that this kind of data creation is anti-carceral because neither Lofthouse nor this wild Karen suffered any consequences from the state. They didn't get arrested. They didn't even get in trouble. Um, women of Color's anti-racist platform work prototypes reparative cultural competencies to address those that are harmed. This is the minor feeling that gets surfaced when we look at anti-Asian racism. Um, doing the hard work of uploading this, um, not being compensated, being attacked, managing the consequences. This is something we ought to be thinking about as a way to remedy. So these images um, bring up strong emotions. They're in parks, they're family reunions, they're in restaurants. We can hear voices, imagine ourselves at a family gathering or walking along a trail. One of the few things we could do during COVID. One way to be in solidarity is to listen to the voices like of those who are harmed, like Jordan Chan, rather those who harm, rather than those who harm, like Lofthouse. The Pew study finds that most people don't believe that banning or suspensions work on both political sides. They create oppositional relations between platforms and help users stoke defiance and resistance that enable them to gather a new coterie of supporters and push back um, in ways that really ignore the target. Um, in a 2019 study by Shona Beck, Hameson, and Nakamura, that was a study that I did with some colleagues at Michigan, um, targets of online abuse were asked about reparative approaches to content moderation. What could we do to make targets feel better instead of making the perpetrator feel worse? As Nancy read in her introduction to this talk, I'm a member of the new Disco Network, which the Mellon Foundation funded and stands for Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism. And I'm going to do some speculation here. What shifts in platform work could we achieve if we envision the young women of color campaigning against racism on their phones to capture, contextualize, and engage with this as public educators? Their content engages at least as many viewers and engenders as many public conversations about race and racism as you would find in a classroom or a diversity training. How can we leverage this organic, intimate, and effective resource and acknowledge it? How to protect these workers? How to pull this labor out from below the waterline? What if in creating this opportunity for public conversation on social media um, about what it means to take up space where your very existence is seen as contingent or conditional or temporary, because of your skin color, 
What if they are doing work on a par with diversity trainers, brochures, PSAs, and other techniques and approaches that are often not seen as effective, but are our kind of go-to moments in moments of untenable racial tension? Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lisa. What a great, what a great and interesting talk. I have a ton of questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. I don't want to dominate, although I'm quite happy to do that because I know how to do that. Um, <laughs> Let me start off by asking um, about the note on which you ended around optimism. I I I I love the name of the new the the new. I, I guess it's not exactly a center. It's it's a collaboration, right? The Disco Network. Um, obviously, the the mere name makes one want to dance. Uh, and I love that it ends with optimism. I think that it's so hard in these times. And when looking at videos like those you've posted. Um, and thinking about things like Jordan having to go private while uh, the heroic waitress is valorized, it's hard to find optimism right now. So I'm, I, I would love to hear more about how you all came to land on optimism as a theme and where your sense of optimism comes from. Um, and then I have some follow up questions on that. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, it is hard to pull optimism out of having had almost 18 months in front of Zoom. And, you know, people who are even privileged enough to do the work this way already feeling burned out and tired. Um, and uh, I think we were interested in it because our collective, which is, you know, people of color and people with disabilities, are very tired of the deficit model of thinking about the groups that we belong to. You know, I think the deficit model of these poor people, they're less than, they're not as good at, you know, they've been, they're not competent. Um, I think is designed to invoke pity, you know, but that's not quite the same thing as respect. So I think if you're in one of these groups, it's apparent to you every day how ingenious and how creative and how effective often. Um, people can be given, you know, marginalization and so on. So I think we were trying to do a different kind of internet research around marginalization, right? To start from the premise that people of color, disabled people, children have not always always been there and playing crucial roles, um, but that they're, they're doing that now in ways that maybe not aren't even available to more mainstream and well-funded projects. So, it's partly that, you know, that I think trying to create sadness or abjection for a group is just not a good anti-racist strategy, right? It's, it doesn't work well. It, it, pity only gets you so far, right? Um, I think talking about the common interests that a lot of us have is kind of the collaborative part as well. You know, in longer versions of this talk, I'm very interested in all the work that children did and do to maintain networks and make them usable for each other. So Yasmin Kafai at Penn has written about this. She's done amazing work on how little kids were making avatars to represent kids of color like 15 years ago. You know, they were just doing it on their own because they thought it was necessary and they just thought it was weird. Those things weren't there. And so that stuff is there. It, it's not a hidden history, just like the Navajo workers, just like you know that. Um, it's just not talked about as part of the, the narrative of what made Silicon Valley great or what made games popular or why everybody likes to do certain things. Um, but I'm very interested in this idea that just like the capillaries of the body are very small and can't be seen, but are doing a lot of the work of making the body healthy and helping it to heal itself, um, that there are a lot of people who are excluded from Silicon Valley for lots of reasons, who have always done the work that holds up right, that makes possible or that scaffolds the work that becomes more high profile work. So um, I think part of the inquiry is why is Silicon Valley, which started out as this meritocratic space, like if you can code, we don't care what color you are, what gender you are, race you are, how did it turn into the most racially and gender segregated industry that there is? You know, like having that one value of merit and the actual material reality of great discrimination I think everyone's confused about how that happened. So that's what I'm trying to do, that if we changed our perspective a little bit about who's working and who's benefiting in digital culture, 
maybe we can address that a little more and that you know some of these problems are not just problems of pay but also problems of categorization you know so mm -hmm. i could view these videos as being you know wonderful insurgent acts of grassroots activism and somebody else could view them as being pernicious cancel culture against you know innocent white restaurant goers yeah yeah Jackson's chimed in with a question. He says, I love the way you're asking these questions, but obviously I get it. But you know, for a friend, uh, can you say more clearly how you're lining up an anti-racist counter video and volunteer moderation of an online community is both digital repair? And I guess it, it raises the broader question of what, for you, what is digital repair? What, what are the boundaries of that process? That's such a great question. <laughs> um, because the word repair has a lot of different shades and a lot of meanings. And I think especially the community of science and technology scholars have been trying to shift the focus of inquiry away just from making, you know, or design to maintenance and repair, which are necessary for us to have things. You know, things don't roll off of the conveyor belt or usually out of some Asian woman's lap or hands um, and then exist in a completely kind of unassisted or unsupported way. Like there's lots of hands to get involved there. Um, I think the anti-racist work that you live within, but which is very ambient, right? So this thing in the restaurant could have happened a block away from you. It could have happened next to you. And in fact, I think we've all seen these things happen next to us and thought, oh God, like this is so horrible. I wish someone would do something. So I was thinking of making that video as, as being a form of that kind of repair. You know, the, I haven't talked much about what that does to the space, but I think we've all been in that space. So to make the video, to mobilize the kind of antibody-like coalition around it, which were just people who didn't know each other, but all kind of came together to hustle that guy out. And, you know, one guy takes it, one, the lady made the video and the waitress is doing her thing. Um, it's a very kind of performative space of repair, which is just of the moment. Right. And, and the act of capturing it models what repair could look like, what social repair could like, look like. And I think there were a bunch of videos like this about how to help someone who's being harassed on a bus, you know, where there are literally kind of performances or re reproductions or reprises of how you would go and sit next to this person on the bus. Oh, this was um, actually after this happened both after Arabs were being attacked or Arab looking people were being attacked after 9-11 and also after Asians were being attacked. So what can white allies do? And it just made a video, like sit next to the person, talk to them about the weather. So that's social repair. I would say the act of making the video and choosing how to venue it, right? How to influence <laughs> um, is the act of digital social repair, which straddles both changing the um, Kind of digital environment by, by risking putting that out there right as another commentary on race relations um, that was rooted in the act of your own intervention in the real world so i think i'm trying to talk about repair in both senses and how they're intermingled with each other right that what you what's what some people might call canceling other people might call repair Um, there's a there's a question which I think is a clarification question, um, which I just want to make sure you have the opportunity to address, which is your use of the term Indian rather than indigenous or native. And I think that's when you were quoting the 1965 document. Do you want to just briefly speak to your use of, of terminology? Yeah, that's completely valid. It's so complicated when you're doing historical work, because if you're just reading from a paper as I was, right, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you can't really change it because that was the name of the government agency. In fact, I think it still is the name of the government agency. So it's not a word I would necessarily use myself or that an indigenous person might use. But, you know, when you're using the historical record, you kind of have to use what they had at the time. Thanks for thank you for that clarification. Language is always uh, always loaded and we do want to make sure that we are being sensitive. Um, questions are now rolling in, which I very much appreciate. Um, some are rather detailed and some, some are rather broad. Uh, one person asks about, and I would love to hear more about this, expanding more on the DISCO network, what's its mission and how can people get involved? 
Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the mission of the Disco Network is to leverage the insights of the humanities in particular, um, especially areas within it, like women and gender studies, black critical studies, Asian American studies, which is what I do, disability studies, um, to take more, I would say, extensive critical engagement with digital objects and practices. So, you know, one way to deal with objects and practices that we don't like or that we think could work better is to try to fix them, right? So to try and solve for specific problems. They could be scope big, they could be scope small, but, you know, often a, a more kind of technological approach is to solve for. And in those moments, I think humanists and social scientists can be useful. But in the end, what we're doing is trying to make the problem a certain size, right? Um, I think one reason why the Mellon Foundation might have wanted to fund us is to give us a long time, you know, months, say, or years to think about the problem of racism, say, racism, disability, and why it's so prevalent on the internet. Um, these are complicated problems. They require several different kinds of expertise. It takes a long time to read all the literature. And so I think what critical humanists can do is to really sit with that problem and think about it for many, many, many days, right? In a collaborative group with us and with some of the new fellows that we hope to hire who could come from all kinds of disciplines. So we wanna write at least two different kinds of things, scholarly monographs, we all gotta move ahead in our academic lives and get jobs and publish with good presses, but also some more open pieces that might be more pointedly about what's a tech win and what's a tech fail in the context of a critical race or gender or disability studies lens. So um, uh, those are things we wanted to do together and we also wanted to do them in a kind of deeper, longer way. Um, I benefit so much from journalists, you know, like they break so many of the most important stories and then they have to move on because that's the job, like you move on. So I've often thought, well, what if we had a lot of time and a lot of intellectual firepower to really continue to press on these questions and ground them in history and start doing more archival work. That's what the Disco Network is for. Thank you, that's great. I'm so, so excited about it. I can't wait to see what you all do um, and also who you bring aboard and how, that, how, it, how it expands. Um, there are now a number of questions rolling in, um, some, some, personal, others not. Let me ask uh, a couple of more questions that are um, more technical about the talk and, and technology and then expand out to some of these broader questions. People are asking about what they can do and, and, and how to navigate situations they experience. Um, Jen Jack, he's a king. Hi. <laughs> Great to see you, Jack. Um, poses the question about um, how you came to select those videos from TikTok and how you negotiate the fact that we know that algorithms are seeking virality and that videos like that uh, play a role, of course, in what constitutes virality and in, and in what you're going to see in the first place. And if I can piggyback on that question, one thing that keeps coming to my mind through the talk um, and through the conversation is what, what, what do you see as the role of platforms here? Mm -hmm. Right. Is it is it all on these young women under the waterline to fix racism or is there something that platforms could be doing? Oh, that's so interesting. Well, platforms have their own waterline, right? Right. There's a lot of people who are working to make those things stable or who are trying to refine them or trying to make them more equal from within. And we don't know who those people are either. I mean, I think that happens often on the very small level of someone flagging something that someone else might not flag. Right. Or someone thinking to push back when something gets taken down. But that stuff all takes a lot of time. And that's why I would argue it's labor, right? It improves the platform and it's free labor. So, you know, already those who are the most harmed are the most motivated, but also the least capitalized to actually produce that resistance. So um, I think the methods question is really important here because one of the humanistic methods that I was just talking about is to choose an object that resonates for you along several different axes. So for me, this was really bringing together performance, you know, a kind of um, a kind of story about how it came to be made and what happened after. So I think with viral video, you see it, you just kind of move on. 
But thinking about the consequences to makers, to producers, especially young women, um, to creating these things, right? How you can make a viral video and then totally get kind of harassed offline by people who react badly to it. Like the kind of racial politics continue after that video has been made. Um, so I'm interested in diving deeper into specific objects than we usually do, right? Trying to look at them in a more kind of diachronic way of how the platform allowed this kind of performance to hit in this kind of way, and then the kind of price that was paid and by who after the fact. So um, this question about uh, virality, I think when, when you have low social power, you get really clever about what virality really is. You know, is it a dance? Like the dance of the Vancouver Park woman? You know, that 100% made that video. If she hadn't chosen to do that dance, which a lot of people said was like the gas station blow up doll dance. You know, so how do you take that and make it into a teaching moment, <laughs> which is what those girls did, I think. Um, uh, that's why I picked it. I think it was emblematic of a lot of videos that are doing that, that don't always get that viral. So, you know, the, the TikTok algorithm has obviously been critiqued strongly. I think it, you know, it does, like most algorithms, not benefit people who are not already viral, right? In some ways, it's a kind of status quo machine. Um, nonetheless, I did find this. So I would keep on checking back to see. In fact, it's been in, in, it's gone now. <laughs> you know, I'm not surprised that it went away. I think it got a lot of pushback again. Um, you know, how dare you swear at these this old lady? I don't know. Um, so that's another issue about TikTok is that you have to capture that in the minute. You just don't know if it's going to be there. You don't know why it's gone. Um, I reached out to the person who made it and didn't hear back, and I'm not surprised. You know, people don't necessarily want to talk to a researcher. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm continuing to be very interested in the role that race and gender play in virality. You know, is there a kind of challenging racism and sexism, way to challenge racism and sexism, which is palatable, which is linkable, which people enjoy, and what's the other side? <laughs> so, you know, I want to know more myself about how platforms can help us package these moments that everyone can get something out of, but also sometimes suppresses them and conversely how moments that are just too challenging and almost can't be talked about. Um, for example, George Floyd, right? It's a totally different method for talking about something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are running out of time and there are so many interesting questions and I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, I do want to to, to ask a couple of, of more practical lived experience kinds of questions that people ask. So in response to the dancing video, Shreya um, points out that that was so blatantly, blatantly clearly steeped in racism, but that she's not sure that white people would have the nuance to have had that be as immediately triggering and as immediately dangerous and obvious and that, and, and, and asks, um, when racism as a concept doesn't have much nuance for most white folks, bringing it up as a topic before others are primed to tolerate the conversation is dangerous. Have you experienced situations like this and do you have reflections to share? And I'm sure with your many years in the classroom, you have <laughs> lots of wisdom on this. So I would love to hear your that's advice. That's such a good question. Well, that's why I chose to write on these, right? You know, the, when the right wing wants to critique the left, they say the left can't meme. I say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the left is memeing all the time and education is itself a meme, right? So to start off a classroom conversation with something like this in many ways invites a different participation than you could get if you start off with words that already trigger people. You know, so, so to simply ask, well, what do you think is happening here? You know, I, I'm hoping that these viral moments are producing that kind of conversation everywhere. You know, that someone's waving someone over to their phone and saying, hey, look at this. And that's where the conversation is happening. Yeah. Um, related to this, somebody asked the question of what as a tech consumer they can do to help. Wow, I love this person. <laughs> what do you think, Nancy? I'm really curious. How can I as a consumer of tech products support the people of color slash women of color who physically craft them? Uh -huh. What do I think? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, 
gosh, it's it's a really hard question. It's a really good question, but I think that I think your capillary idea is a really interesting one, and I think that people have in the in the questions been already posing a lot of levels on which these interventions could happen, right? Is it something that ch changes in the way we address the work of tech creation? So we stop valorizing the heroic dude in the garage and start recognizing the below the waterline people as, as doing valid labor? Is it about policy where some of this labor becomes uh, validated in ways it hasn't been? Or is it and is it about these micro moments of clicking like and spreading and sharing a video and and pushing back against videos and flagging videos like you talk about? I, it's it's probably all of the above. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I like that last part of the answer because it reminds me of your work on fans from a long time ago when people thought fans were just like these impotent passive creatures, you know. But it is these moments of liking even or you know, passing on or framing a little bit, which I think are powerful because they're one-to-one. -one. You know, I make fun of PSAs and diversity trainings because no one learns anything from those. In fact, people hate them. They really mobilize hatred of the genre to kind of circumvent learning. So one thing I would say I don't think is the thing is to um, necessarily see it as a retail movement. So don't buy the red branded thing as opposed to the normal branded thing. I don't think that really matters. You know, don't think about recycling more, though that's probably good. I don't think that really. So I think people tend to think of their interventions being, I'm going to buy this thing. Or I'm not going to buy that thing. And I don't think that's really the same as having a kind of heuristic shift in your mind, right? An actual kind of reclassification in your mind of like, who matters in digital culture? And how are these things feeding into each other? You know, so like you said, for the first part, we have an idea of who matters, but it's not right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. There have been a bunch more questions posted. Uh, we do have on the on the website some lists about of further references for more information that you can turn to. Um, and please be sure to join us on October 27th when Simone Brown from the University of Texas will be presenting a talk called Acrylic, Metal, Blue, and a Means of Preparation, Imagining and Living Black Life Beyond the Surveillance State, another talk we're excited to host. And remember that Lisa's talk will be available on YouTube, so send all your friends, students, colleagues, others you think should learn this stuff. And thank you again for being here, and thank you, Lisa, for such a great talk and discussion.